everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, first, I wanted to thank Rebecca and the Lewis Public Library for uh, helping the Delaware Historical Society host this program tonight. And also a very quick thank you um, to all of our panelists for agreeing to participate. Uh, this program, um, A Woman's Work is Never Done, was conceived to be the kickoff program for a, a year-long series of programs celebrating the 2020 suffrage centennial. Um, all of the programs in that series are sponsored, partially funded by the Delaware Humanities. Um, so we want to thank the Delaware Humanities as well. Um, if you enjoy the program this evening, we ask that you check out our calendar at dehistory.org. We have another program coming up August 10th called uh, Women Suffragists Below the Color Line. We're going to um, be looking at African-American suffragists and then taking a deep dive um, into Blanche Stubbs, uh, who had, um, lived in Wilmington and uh, supported the suffrage movement in there. Um, I'm zooming in tonight from Wilmington, so uh, I'm pretty excited that this is happening, but we're going to, you don't want it, you didn't come to hear me talk, so I'm going to introduce um, our moderator, Dr. Emerald Christopher Bird. Uh, Dr. Christopher Bird is an assistant professor with the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Delaware. Her research examines the socio-political position of Black women in the United States. She regularly serves as an expert on panels and publishes scholarly articles on the cultural politics of race, class, gender, and sexuality, and their translation into public policy and social institutions. Dr. Christopher Bird is an alumna of the University of Delaware, and she holds a Master of Arts degree in Education and Human Development, as well as Women's Studies, and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Language, Literacy, and Culture. Uh, Dr. Christopher Bird has a forthcoming book entitled Unfit for Marriage, Black Womanhood and Relationship Advice Literature, and also a forthcoming book chapter, uh, E2K Asperas and What Are We Waiting For? Indigenous Women and Hip Hop in In This Together, Blackness, Indigeneity, and Hip Hop. So Dr. Christopher Bird, if you could take it from here. Wonderful, thank you, Rebecca. Good evening. I'd first like to thank Rebecca Fay again, Rebecca Lowe, the Delaware Historical Society, and Lewis Public Library for hosting this event. Our esteemed panelists this evening come from a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. I'm excited to hear their perspective on past and current political challenges. Tonight's discussion is shaped in a way that connects the history of struggle for women's suffrage and political participation to the urgency of our current moment. This year marks the centennial of the 19th Amendment. That amendment prohibited the states and of course the federal government from denying the vote on the basis of sex. However, it should be noted that some women were and still are barred from the polls and political participation on basis other than sex, such as race. Despite this knowledge, we cannot understand or appreciate the complexities of these movements and women's political participation without thinking about the institution building that women were and are engaged in. Prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment, women were already preparing for prime time. Beginning in 1910, women were achieving hard-won victories at the state level, and before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, 15 of the 48 states enfranchised some women on the, on the same basis as men, while another 12 guaranteed at least presidential suffrage for women. This is a crucial component in understanding the ways in which significant political change can occur, in that it's not only at the federal level, but at the state level as well. And some of our panel, panelists will share that with you this evening. On the ground, struggles and local victories accelerated the process in winning the 19th Amendment. Although it is common for us to see the larger suffrage groups that were predominantly white and middle class, between 1910 and 1920, there were many local dynamic and multicultural groups fighting for suffrage. We want to ensure that the narrative is both reflective of the racism, sexism, and discrimination many women experienced, while simultaneously acknowledging the work women of those demographics, mainly marginalized demographics, achieved. The suffragist movement and the current movements gaining women further political participation 
is very much multiracial, even if it is not interracial. While we are living in a moment where the media disseminates images of people being called to protest, this narrative ignores how many women, in particular women of color, have been practicing and preparing for these moments. The women on the panel this evening represent those that have been doing the work, preparing and continuing to stand against discrimination. With that said, I'd like to start the discussion. Each panelist will introduce themselves and as they introduce themselves and share a little bit about their background, I'd like them to speak on where we currently are since this event was first conceived. The event was conceived by Rebecca Fay, and it was before COVID-19, before the Black Lives Matters uprisings, and before mass unemployment. I'd like to hear from each of our panelists their thoughts on how today's topic connects with the wrongs of our political past and how we can move forward in the present. And we will start with Charita Kavachi Mateko. Thank you. I am the co-chair of the Delaware Hispanic Commission, the coordinator for the Delaware Civil Rights Coalition, and a member of the board of the ACLU. I am a lawyer, former lawyer, turned out restorative justice practitioner. So today's problems have a long, deep history. Centuries back, Francis Bacon in the 16th century and the scientific revolution untied our connectedness to nature. Years back, the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher untied our connectedness to each other. Thatcher said famously, there was no such thing as society. Today, the world sees what this dystopian antisocial greed looks like when played out to an extreme never experienced before of the part on the part of Donald Trump. This is the blatant, some will say abnormal, even pathological and sociopathic hostility and denial of the Trump presidency to our behaviors, customs and norms, laws and policies of social care given and connectedness, which is what allow us to feel empathy. Today's America is living through the chickens coming home to roost and three fundamental lies. So the first lie that the free market has no relationships to early connectedness to any place. It is purely conceptual and can continue to abuse people and nature on a finite planet indefinitely without end. Okay, the second lie is that we are not a part of nature. And we can thrive indefinitely while in fact, nature dies day by day before our own eyes. The third line, the finder's keeper's rule, by which rich white discoverers in the new world could discover, name, own and enslave Native Americans, destroy and deny their co-eco-centric culture. And they do the same on the coast of Africa, enslaving, owning Africans, and destroying, denying their ecocentric culture. Hispanics in America have been afflicted with similar systemic racism from San Agustin, our first community, to San Francisco, including the 55% of Mexico that was violently taken to become one third of the continental United States. And our constitutions, laws, and policies are a historic record of this deep systemic racism. The COVID pandemic simply plays the role of revealing this systemic racism today in the structure of our medical care system. But it is hardly limited to only that part of society. Racism systematically distorts employment, housing, education, wealth accumulation, the law, and policing. So later I would like to refer more about the law and the judicial system. Thank you. And next, Shanae Darty. Uh, 
Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Shanae Darby. I am the founder of Black Mothers in Power. It is an issue campaign addressing um, infant mortality rates for Black babies. Black babies are two to three times more likely to die than white babies. And the sole primary reason for that is because of implicit bias and racism within the healthcare system in the society that we live in. So we're looking at historical racism, we're looking at systematic racism, and we're looking at the racism that we face on an everyday basis of just living and just being Black. Um, so that's what Black Mothers in Power, we're trying to address on a bit like um, primary issue um, with our issue campaign. A little bit about my background. Um, I went to Temple University. I have my undergrad in mass communications and African American studies. I got my master's in Africana studies with a focus on women's studies and ethnography. Um, so um, I love history. I love learning um, about all history, but specifically about Black history and um, the trials and Trump triumphs of my ancestors, especially Black women. Um, I love being a Black woman. I love the things that we have contributed to the movement, we have contributed to society, and that we're still contributing to today. Um, so I'm just here today to uh, make sure that um, their voices aren't lost from 100 years ago and that we acknowledge the contributions they did make and that we acknowledge the racism um, that we faced um, in the movement um, and what the 19th Amendment meant to a Black woman who was being lynched when the 19th Amendment passed and white women were voting and they called um, Black men the N-word, right? Um, that needs to be acknowledged and um, not swept under the rug as if we are just all just um, one group and not very diverse. It, it kind of is like it's hurtful to do that when I know Black women that could have been me 100 years ago would have been lynched. Um, so that's where I stand today, and I'm happy to be here to bring that perspective to make sure my ancestors, the Black woman from 100 years ago, and I hope 100 years from now, my great-grandkids and future Black women are making sure that my voice is not being lost and is still being heard 100 years ago, and they tell our story of what we're going through today, and they embrace that and make sure that is not forgot and that our voice isn't um, silent for another 100 years. Thank you, Shanae. Next, we have Colleen Davis. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am your Delaware State Treasurer. I, I just wanna start by saying thank you all so much. Um, I'm really honored to be here with this amazing panel of women. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that I think that we've seen more recently. So perspective is, I think, huge when we're talking about um, what the last hundred years and what the last several months have, have produced for us. And one of the things that have been sort of top of mind and, and, a, and a, a large topic of discussion has been um, mental health. And I think that representation matters to our political mental health. So the fact that all but one president and um, every vice president throughout history uh, in the United States have been white men um, is, is really kind of unbelievable when you think about our American psyche. Um, the fact that we haven't seen leadership until very recently um, of color I think really, whether it's, whether it's a physical toll, um, you know, when we're talking about lynchings, I, I think that there's definitely a political mental health check that kind of needs to go on at this stage. Um, I think that one of the ways to uh, push back against that is for us to really promote and, um, and encourage women of color to run for office. I would love to see greater representation of women of color, you know, um, black and brown women getting into office. And I think that we saw that this past uh, election cycle in 2018, we saw some amazing um, changes uh, across the board. And, um, and I think that a lot of the work that Representative Valerie Longhurst has done 
um, to, to get us to pass um, and really be, be talking about uh, equality for women has been huge. And I think um, it's really brought into light what's been going on the last several months, how much change we really and truly uh, need. And when I think about the very first woman to run and to receive, um, to, to look for the Democratic nomination to run for presidency was in, um, was Shirley Chisholm, who was our very first African-American woman elected to Congress back in 1968. And you know, honestly, as a kid growing up, having seen my grandmother uh, involved in the NAACP and involved in uh, looking for more equality, more racial equality, I am, I am dismayed that we haven't seen uh, more variety in the White House. Um, and I think that, that there's, a, there's a movement in a, in a positive way, and I think we have an opportunity to really make this um, uh, a really pivotal moment in history. Um, so I, I hope I've answered your question, but, um, but I'm really excited to continue the conversation. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Colleen. Next, Morgan Keller. Hey, everybody. Um, I am Morgan Keller. I'm the communications manager at the ACLU of Delaware. I have been there for almost three years now, and I absolutely love the job that I do and the people that I get to work with. Um, through my job, I've had the opportunity to work with so many of the women on this panel, and I am just, in, I'm grateful to be on this panel with all of you, and I'm grateful to the organizers of this event. Um, so the title of this event, A Woman's Work is Never Done, how accurate is that, right? As Chirito stated, the pandemic didn't necessarily create a slew of new problems for women in America. It made existing systemic issues glaringly obvious to people who never opened their eyes to them before. That's part of what the Black Lives Matter uprisings are about, right? People have been protesting since May because the movement is about bringing to light far more than just a few incidents of horrific police brutality. It's about overcoming centuries of systemic oppression from white America, including in the women's rights movement. Women have been fighting hard for gender equality for over 100 years, and we've made leaps and bounds in that movement but often at the expense of women of color, trans people, women with different abilities, and other women that didn't fit the status quo. To move forward and achieve true gender equality, true gender justice, we have to tackle racism, transphobia, ableism, xenophobia, and all other forms of oppression. Thank you, Morgan. Next, we have Representative Valerie Longhurst. Oh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining. And I want to thank Rebecca Fay for putting together this wonderful panel and keeping the conversation going. A woman's work is never, never done, and that couldn't be more accurate. Um, I'm going to, I've, I'm the House Majority Leader in the House of Representatives. I've been a state rep for 16 years. And out of those 16 years, I spent 12 of them in leadership position. Um, I love my job. I love pushing the agenda of, um, of women forward. And I, as I forget who mentioned earlier, is that two years ago, we um, had a more diverse group of women coming into the General Assembly, which has had added a different dynamic to the way legislation is done. And Senator Lockman is on this call, or on this call, so I'm going to give her a big shout out. She did our first two years, and the General Assembly did a great job. Um, but I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things and the challenges that I've had as a female legislator in the General Assembly. Um, back in 2015, I put together a package of women's bills that some of you may be aware of, which we addressed um, wage secrecy, domestic violence. Um, looking at um, rape kits and actually paid maternity leave. And those are some of the issues that women are faced with on a daily basis because our, our pay is much less than men and black women is even less and Hispanic women is even less. So uh, we passed 
11 pieces of legislation that tried to move the women's agendas forward. Uh, we've also been working, we passed the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, which was passed um, two years ago, which was very, or actually, yeah, I guess it would have been about two years ago. It was very exciting. It took us a long time in Delaware to get the Equal Rights Amendment done. But with the um, support of the women in my caucus and in the Senate, we were able to move that and get it done and make it um, put it in the Constitution. One of the biggest monumental days of my, my career was the day that we passed that Equal Rights Amendment. Um, but as a female legislator in, in, the, um, in leadership, I think I have a responsibility to continue the conversations of what's going out and what's going on in the world. And last year we had put criminal justice reform on the top agenda in the Delaware General Assembly. We introduced about 19 pieces of legislation in that first year. We did get 11 pieces of it done, which was monumental. I don't think people thought we could accomplish that, but we did. We did an expungement bill. We did a lot of great criminal justice reform with the help of my colleagues and um, the Attorney General Kathy Jennings. And we're gonna continue that movement. Um, we've also done for juvenile justice reform and we're gonna to continue to do that. Um, I, COVID hit us in March of this year, and it was, during that pandemic, it was very tough for us in the General Assembly because we had to go virtual, and we had so many pieces of legislation that we wanted to get done this year that we were unable to get done. We had to prioritize what was going to be done this year, and obviously by our state constitution, we had to get the budget done, the bond bill, and grant and aid. Um, on that, we tried to, categorize certain areas that the state would need to do in the limited amount of time that we had. And we focused it on anything COVID related, revenue enhancements, charters, changes that need to be done. And we were on a really good path of getting all that accomplished. And then on March, um, in March, uh, the Floyd killing happened. And that really changed the direction of the, the way the General Assembly needed to go. We thought we were going to be on this nice path, and then that happened. It's like we have to address what just happened. And our Black Caucus, who stepped up to the plate and came to leadership and to the General Assembly, said there were certain pieces of legislation that we need to get done today. And we worked with them. The first one was passing an Equal Rights Amendment for race, which I'm very excited. Um, Senator Brown led the charge on it in the House. It was Representative Sherry Dorsey Walker. We did get that piece of legislation through in a, a fair amount of time and pretty unanimous. It was, it, was, it was pretty iconic to see such a piece of legislation get done so quickly when it took me so long just to get the Equal Rights Amendment for women passed. But at the time, it was what needed to be done and that's what happened. We also passed the banning of the chokehold, which um, Representative Chihuahua, uh, uh, Nambi Chokawachi, whoops, uh oh, somebody disappeared on me. Um, passed that piece of legislation, we got that done. And we still needed to do a lot more, but we didn't have a lot of time to really address some of the issues. So we have put together two task force and um, to, to really dive into policing in the state of Delaware. And those task forces have been put together. I think Senator Lockman's working on one of them and um, uh, uh, Representative, um, and then we have Representative Stephanie T. Bones also working on it. But we're hoping in the next six months that that task force comes together. And if we get back into session in, in January, we're going to have some le legislation that we could advance forward on that. Um, so we're moving. It's tough being a woman in legislative hall. But when you have a tribe of women behind you that are as strong as Senator Lockman here, um, we're able to get some good legislation done. And as um, the 100th anniversary of the suffrage movement, I did put House Concurrent Resolution 21 together, which we formed a committee in, in Delaware to put together a parade. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we will not be able to do the parade, but we do have three, landmark, um, that, three landmarks that we're gonna be doing in each county. So if you all wanna look forward to those, I will be there speaking on behalf of the women. But we have one in Georgetown, the old state house, and then in Wilmington. So look on your calendars, and I, I guess we could share that in an email later, those dates. But we'd love to see everybody that's on this call to come out and support the women's suffrage movement. We may not have the parade, but hopefully these landmarks will, um, will add some value and, and keep us moving in the right direction. So thank you.
and I'll answer any questions that you have. I have a lot of information of what <laughs> we've done in the General Assembly over the last few years. Wonderful, thank you. Next, Pamela Malsh. Okay, hi, my name is Pamela Malsh and I am one of the co-chairs of, oh, am I still muted? Oh, okay, I'm just, it's not. No, you're good, Pamela. Okay, because I'm just not speak review on me. I guess I just talk. Okay. Um, um, I'm one of the co-chairs of Women's March Sussex, Delaware, and along with Sue Niden, who is my co-chair, um, we formed the local chapter of Women's March um, after the large Women's March in um, Washington, D.C., the day after the inauguration. Um, but let me back up a little bit and talk about my, um, who I am and where I come from. I uh, was a music teacher all through my career, um, but my mother was a feminist and I was raised by a feminist. And she, back in 1972, went to her first consciousness raising group. And then I, as a high school student, was raised with those topics and her activism at our dining room table. Um, I went to my first uh, pro-choice march and rally when I was 16, and um, I canvassed and did work for the ERA uh, back in 76. Um, and then I went to school, went off, off to college and became a music teacher and had my family and um, uh, didn't really think much about politics. I sat at election day this year, um, election night and with, like everyone else my mouth falling to the floor thinking how bad this was going to be but I had no idea it was going to be this bad. Um, since January 2016 and the Large Women's March, the local group, we have done much about education as far as educating um, a lot of people in Sussex County, as you know, are transplants from other places. And uh, Delaware politics is very different than some of the other states. Um, and so we have had a, a very strong, very good pro uh, program for the last three and a half years teaching people about uh, Delaware politics. We have a 101 class, a 102 class. And we're before COVID, we were getting ready to do our advocacy um, class, how to be an advocate. Um, we also realized early on that we could not be all things to everyone. There were so many issues and there are so many things that affect women and children, um, but we could not address them. We weren't, um, there, weren't, there weren't enough hours in the day to address every, um, every issue. And there are, um, there are groups that are doing that. And so we had a fair that, um, to help people focus their energies and figure out who, to, who they wanted to work with, whether it was anything from uh, water rights and environmental to domestic violence to um, um, pay equity to uh, uh, rep reproductive rights and, and all, all of our issues. And so we had a large fair with um, close to 100 groups being represented um, that we have helped um, people get information. We also have a large email um, uh, list, uh, email group in which we're able to, I feel like we, I've always said we're kind of the warehouse for information. People send us stuff and we get it out to our group of over 700 people. Of like, this is where you can get this information. You might want to be interested in this uh, presentation. Um, here's how we need your help um, and, and things like that. Um, Let's see, uh, where we were, we have also, is when COVID hit and when the, um, and when the recent Black Lives Matter um, things exploded, uh, we continued our dialogues in, about racism. We had started a dialogues, uh, we had had three already um, about racism and anti-Semitism in order to um, try to address some of the issues that were a women's march faced internally um, because we felt like we were there was there were things happening that were trying to divide us and if we're divided 
we're not going to be very successful. So we've started that and now we've had um, some very successful dialogues and town halls with um, the Southern Alliance for Racial Justice uh, on Zoom and Zoom has obviously changed everybody's lives. So we're, we're doing a lot of things on there now. Um, I have more to talk about as far as the history is concerned, but I think that's one of the very first question that will be directed at Marlene and I. So I'll save that discussion about the history and my surprises there and what I've been doing. Like every other white woman and white suburban woman, um, yeah, not to form a book club. That's what I read one place. We're all forming book clubs and reading books and learning. But my, my focus has really been, okay, being raised the way I was, I didn't think I was racist. What is it that I don't know and how can I help? Um, and, and I've been very surprised at what I've learned about American history that we weren't taught. So I'll go into that in a little bit more um, in a bit. Thanks. Thank you, Pamela. Next, Kathy McGinnis. Um, hi there. I am I am Kathy McGinnis. I am your first female state auditor in the history of Delaware. So uh, I I wanted to start and, and by saying where we stand today in our society is a direct correlation from the political wrongings of the past, and we've have long decided in our political process to not take a stand on social justice or criminal justice or economic justice or, or uh, and brush everything under the rug, under the table for the next political leaders. And I, this strategy has got to stop now with us. Uh, transparency and accountability are the pillars of my office as state auditor. And we need these pillars now more than ever in our political process to help fight against the wrongs of our past. Uh, I, I was previously elected for 18 years. I'm proud to say that um, I, I co-sponsored legislation before there was uh, House Bill 99 for equality. Um, I have stood on the front lines with Pan, Pan, Planned Parenthood. Uh, and, and, you know, so people could cross and get into an event or where they needed to go. I've uh, also been very proud to know and support people like our uh, House Majority Leader Valerie Longhurst. I mean, she has done so much to forward women in Delaware, and I don't think that people understand all the hard work and what she's had to deal with to to get the bills passed that are there today to support us. And 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 a hello to Tizzy Lockman. I'm very excited because now I feel that there are there's changes, there's fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, and voices that are there and we need more of them now uh, so we can further uh, our goal of equality. So I'm very excited to be here today. I will tell you after the election, the last presidential election, uh, we didn't have this uh, great network here in Sussex County for the Women's March and I was driving to Wilmington once a month to be on a group with uh, key point people of different women advocates advocacy groups and organizations. So I'm excited. Uh, you're growing strong in Sussex and uh, delighted to be a part of this. And I look forward to, the, to tonight's dialogue. So thank you. Thank you. Next, Marlene Saunders. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be a part of this uh, important event and this inf uh, important uh, discussion and glad everyone who is uh, in the meeting was able to, to fit it uh, uh, in, in, in your in your schedule. Um, by profession, I'm a social worker. I've been a social worker since I was a child. I think I was born with the social worker gene. Um, I retired uh, in 2014, having worked at Delaware State University uh, for nearly 30 years. And uh, when I retired, I was, uh, I retired as uh, chair of the uh, social work department. Uh, though I'm retired, I'm more active now than ever, thankfully. Um, um, in terms of, of organizations, I'm on the steering committee of the uh, Women's March Sussex Delaware, uh, as well as the steering committee of the Southern Delaware Alliance for Racial Justice, which is a small but powerful organization that's about achieving equality, fair opportunity, and, 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 and social justice. 
uh, bringing racism uh, in the forefront. And we've been doing that uh, through a variety of ways, town hall meetings, um, perhaps uh, some of you um, participated in the, the, the two meetings that happened not too long ago, having to do uh, one having to do uh, with law enforcement. Perhaps if you live uh, in, in the Lewis Rehoboth area, uh, you've seen our signs, one of which says racism uh, hurts everyone, uh, enough is enough. Now, when I said okay uh, to, to being a part you know, of this discussion and seeing that it was hosted by the uh, Delaware Historical Society, what I was about was, was putting the discussion in historical perspective. And, and looking at uh, the good and bad uh, that has happened, what is going on today, and how to draw on the good things, the bad things, and take advantage of this unique time in which we find ourselves uh, to, you know, to make a difference. And as well as to look at things that, that haven't changed. Um, as I was preparing uh, for uh, today's discussion, you know, one of the things that hasn't changed is that for African-American women uh, who were involved uh, in the movement uh, for, the, uh, for the right to vote, there were two issues. One was being female and the other was being African-American or being black. And uh, you know, that, that dual focus still, still, uh, prevails, still prevails today. However, I think there's an important lesson that those women have, ta have taught us, despite the fact that they were alienated uh, by, by, by uh, uh, white suffragists who, for example, asked them to, to march in the back of the line uh, when uh, the 19th Amendment was close to being passed. Uh, the leaders of the movement uh, uh, put uh, the, the rights of, 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 of black women on the back burner uh, and, and focused on white women uh, getting, uh, white women getting, white women getting the vote. I think the lesson that black women uh, have taught uh, uh, suffragists today uh, is that despite adversity, keeping faith with the process and hanging in there and being vigilant uh, is, is an important lesson uh, that they have, they have taught us. And how to develop alliances, even with people who are not with you, you know, 100%. And I think what we have to do is, is given the racial divide uh, that exists, how can we overcome that and, and be about change uh, uh, in this terrible uh, moment uh, in, which we, uh, in which we find ourselves. Uh, the, the disparities that uh, the COVID-19 made um, perfectly clear to us, as well as the horrific murder of, of Mr. Floyd certainly were problems not new to us, but for a whole lot of people, the situation, particularly white people, has helped them connect the dots and have helped them see how the circumstances in which we find ourselves today can be traced back to enslavement uh, and to racism, which is still a uh, important kernel uh, in, in American society. But things are changing. I think while there is a, a segment of white America that is, is uh, um, still has notions of African Americans as inhuman uh, and inferior. Uh, there, there's a larger segment of the white population that thinks otherwise. And those strategically, those are the people that we have to identify, with whom we have to identify and forge alliances uh, to uh, make change for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Tara Sheldon. Hi hey there, everybody. Thank you so much for those who organized and are participating in the panel and everybody who has joined us. Um, like Marlene, I think I was also born with that social worker gene. I've studied psychology and women's studies and received my master's in social work. Since I moved to Rehoboth, I have been on the board of Camp Rehoboth, board of directors. I've been very active in PFLAG. Um, I'm also a mother of a 12-year-old transgender girl who came out in first grade in the Cape Henlopen district. And as a result, I have been advocating quite a bit for LGBTQ youth in our school district. And um, 
We've been working a lot on the, the code of conduct to make it more inclusive and to highlight the necessity of focusing on bullying and training for the teachers and the administrators across the board. There's a lot of work to be done, but we've, we've made some progress. Um, I think with COVID, we're realizing that it may be the same storm, but we're in different boats. Um, and it is my hope that more are realizing that if anyone is at risk, that we're all at risk. Um, if there's somebody at the grocery store who is unable to or fearful of discrimination of getting tested, well, then that person is potentially exposing everybody else, right, who can easily get tested and is, doesn't have the fear of being discriminated against or doesn't have the inability or the insurance who doesn't cover it and such. So um, I think we're, I think COVID is highlighting a, a lot of that. I hope to share a little bit more specifically about LGBTQ youth and um, how COVID is impacting them, especially on top of the isolation that they're fear feeling they also may be in unsafe environments at home. And um, again, the, the fear and inability to access support and be around their allies is making it especially difficult for them. So as with any, any obstacle, any big challenges, those who are marginalized are going to experience it very differently from those who may not have the same barriers to healthcare resources, support, et cetera. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. So now let's get into some of our discussion topics. And some of you have already touched upon this, uh, but you, uh, Marlene and Pamela, for example, discussed a little bit about the history of marginalized communities being uh, excluded from the political process, mainly African-American women and Black women. If um, either Marlene or Pamela uh, are willing to engage in that conversation, other panelists are free to jump in as well in that discussion. And Pamela, I see your hand up, so please start. All right, thank you. As I st said, I, I wanted to find out what the history was. And what I was so very, very surprised at is how far back this, I mean, vision, how far back this has gone. Um, and I found, and I'm, so I'm going to be listing some women or some, some, some sources that you might be interested in if you are looking at learning the history, because um, there's some, there were, there have been some important things put out uh, that, that have taught me a lot in the last uh, couple of months. Um, in the Smithsonian Magazine, actually this month, they, there's an article about Lucretia Mott from 1833. She was, um, she, she, she was a woman-led interracial anti-slavery group, and it was called the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. And this anti-slavery uh, slavery and women's movement, um, she felt were, were kindred crusades and that it was important that the two work together. And I thought, okay, good, this is a good start. This is where we are. And um, so then you scoot ahead then to um, 1913, though, and Alice Paul disregarded her her statements. She 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 quoted them, but when it came down to the parade for the vote um, in in on March 3rd in 1913, um, she and her collaborators collaborators inherited an anti-black racism that had always uh, run through suffrage associations around the, the nation at that time. And she had an important, they had an, imp an opportunity to remedy the, the um, problem and they failed to do it. And as Marlene said, the w black women could be in the parade, but at the back at the end. Um, they did not include black women in the, uh, in their fight for the vote. Um, and so there were two women's movements and I did not know this. If you're interested in learning more about this, the PBS um, American Experience uh, program called The Vote is very, very good. This is the kind of history that we should have been learning in our high schools and we did not. Um, and it's important for us to all catch up on it and somehow teach our children. Um, 
Let's go to head then again to 1974. And again, we find ourselves with two women's movements. Um, and this time they meet in Houston at the women's convention. And again, when they're trying to put together their plat the women's platform, uh, there's a big divide because of the um, black women's movement and the, um, the white, the, somehow we could not get them to, uh, we could not meld them together, um, which I, I, that piece of it, I'm still not understanding why. Um, but I do remember my mother coming back from this convention and being all up in arms about uh, that, uh, that they couldn't settle on a platform and how, how bad it was. This was recently dramatized um, by the play about Gloria Steinem. It's called Gloria, and PBS again ran this. Um, and what I found striking about when I was watching this was the audience was just about 90% white. Um, and yet the, the things that they were talking to and the, the pictures of the women up on the PowerPoint that went with the play were the black suffragists, the black uh, leaders of the women's movement then. Um, uh, the other one that is important to watch, I believe, is uh, um, the one about Phil Phyllis Schlafly and the fight for the ERA. And that also um, highlights some of the divisions. In 2016, if we scoot ahead again, the Women's March National Leadership, the national leadership are women of color, and um, they have always been. And one of the cornerstones of the Women's March platform now, or in 2016, was um, a new word to me, which was intersectional. And we, we needed to learn about what that was and we addressed it and we have um, um, uh, learned so much and that every you know that as Marlene pointed out not only is she a woman but she is and not only is she black and the, what those things what happens there together um, in women's march we had other issues of dealing with racism and anti-semitism and when those came up nationally here in Sussex County we we addressed it head on. We um, uh, organized uh, dialogues with our local chapter to, to with um, the uh, with the Alliance for Social Justice, and we also with um, help me, Marlene. What was the the, uh, the Jewish Family Services and the the um, synagogue? Um, and we had a dialogue. We had three dialogues that. that kind of address those to bring us together rather than let us be divided. Um, and so I believe that that's what we're trying to do with Women's March now is to, um, to, to bring us together. And I'll tell you what, if we can't learn from the past history of not embracing everyone and not working together, I'm just so hopeful now that we're going to get it right this time. I was so encouraged in 2018 when I when I see um, as as I can't remember who said it, but it's a word, it's a phrase that I repeat a lot. Representation matters, and representation on all levels matters. And um, so the most important thing that we can do now is vote and get out the vote and register people to vote because that's how we have our say. And so that's what um, Women's March Sussex has been a lot of our um, focus and will be the focus going forward in the next few months is, is the vote. I would like to tell you about one uh, thing that Women's March National is doing and it's actually tomorrow. It's a Zoom webinar and it's about feminism beyond white supremacy. And it's at five o'clock tomorrow and you can register to the National Women's March um, site. So I believe that having the dialogues like this and how, um, and, and education and um, the, other, the other piece is if you see something, say something. We learned that phrase a long time ago. I think now it's time to start calling out any kind of social injustice, whether it be racism, whether it be women, sexism, or anything, that we need to just start calling it out for what it is and, and talking to people about what, even what their uh, um, uh, microaggressions appear to be, they're not aware of things. 
Thank you. And you raised some great points, Pamela, specifically about um, the feminist movement and the historical marginalization, especially of Black women. And part of this, of course, is due to racism. And many of times, the women's movement or the feminist movement does not necessarily want to have those conversations because it's a critique. And of course, the feminist movement has had many critiques um, based on ideas of gender. And so there is um, some pushback and um, tension in actually addressing the racism that exists. Uh, but one of the things that we are coming to learn in history and um, several things that you all have already pointed out uh, is that we can't move forward if we're continuing to marginalize communities, specifically if we're continuing to ignore the systemic racism that is ingrained in many of these movements that we've seen uh, historically and present. Marlene, did you want to add to any parts of the conversation? Yes, uh, I think it was George Santayana said, if we don't learn our history, we're doomed to, we're doomed to repeat it. And uh, as I said in my earlier comments, one of the things that I've been concentrating on as I prepare you know, for this evening is to draw from history for lessons that we can use in order not to repeat history and make the same mistakes. Now, in terms of the two movements, you know, one of the reasons that occurred is that the mainstream movement led by white women they had it. They had an issue that was specific to women, but they didn't particularize it to to African American women or women of color. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So so when the women's movement now, in terms of of a platform for voting, you know, talks about the disparity or the the inequality in 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 pay, uh, what women get compared to what men get. What the movement has to be certain to do is to ensure that that inequality addresses the inequality that 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 women of color experience, African American women and women of color. So, say for example, if 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 if, if white women are making uh, seventy nine uh, seventy nine cents uh, less than what a, a white male is making then the movement needs to, to make known that uh, African-American women are making 65 cents, for example, and, and Latina X women are making 55%. Does everybody see my point? So that, so, that, so that the issues of all women are being addressed rather than just, rather than just one, one sub, one sub, one, uh, one sub population of the, of the uh, so that all women's issues are being addressed rather than just white, rather than just white women. So could I add, could I add to that conversation? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, with the women's package bills that, that we put forward, one of them was a wage secrecy bill. Um, the other one, which was my bill, which was a wage history bill um, in Delaware. So, and I think, I think we have to chip away at that, at that, at that gap that we have with men for all women, black women, Hispanic women, and white women, is that we are paid less than most men. And I think it's based on a couple of things. And we can't go into an interview and go into a job application when you're already making less than that man that's applying for that position. So what this bill did is it, it, it took away the wage history so that women don't have to put their wage history on there because you're already behind, so it makes no sense. You're going in there making less than they are, so they're gonna offer you less also. So um, I really believe that a lot of, a lot of this happened, uh, we could do more at the local le level than we could do at the federal level, and we've been able to accomplish a lot of things at the local level, at the state level. Um, with my colleagues, like Representative Johnson, she's on this, on this call, and Representative Minor Brown, she's on this call. Um, I can tell you when those women came into the General Assembly, it's so nice to have more women in the General Assembly that understand the disparities that we have as, um, as women. And, uh, sorry, my, hold a second. Um, I think I got lost for a minute.
We can still hear you though. Oh, okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know where I went. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my screen, but anyway, what I can say is that I think we have to start at the local level, and when we have, we're having more and more women um, going into the political arena, and as they come into the political arena, they're going to have more to say in moving um, legislation forward, and for me, it's this last legislative set, or this last political election, we had more women come into the General Assembly, and that has changed the dialogue in our caucuses, which we've been allowed to do more more women's bills and more um, issues addressing um, some of the issues of women. I know Representative Brown just had a piece of legislation for black maternity uh, for, for, um, for women that have children, black women that have children, because you know, they have health issues and we need to address that. And she's been on the forefront of that. And I'm so glad that she's a part of our caucus because she's had more dialogue to that conversation. But um, I'm going to go and try to figure out how to get back on here. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but anyway, I, it, stay, it starts at the local level and some of these issues that we have, we need to start feeding it into the legislature so we can start making movement. And behind every strong woman is another tribe of women. And that's the way I look at our General Assembly right now. And leading up to the 2020 election, many people have noted the number of um, Black women, Latinx women, and other women of color that do show up to the polls to vote when they can, uh, even though we still have issues of voter suppression. Uh, but we have these great numbers of women of color voting, and yet, uh, legislation is slow to represent them. So it's very nice to hear, um, Valerie, that you and your colleagues are incorporating some more of those voices. Uh, one of the things that you brought up was uh, health disparities. And a big part of this upcoming election have been conversations around reproductive rights, reproductive justice, as well as the level of maternal mortality among uh, women of color. Uh, can any of the panelists share with us your thoughts on uh, the disparities that uh, women from marginalized communities especially are being impacted by as we um, lead into this election? Um, I could speak to uh, that in the sense that I, you know, male leadership continues to dominate our political parties and idea ideologies. Um, even, even as women have made great strides in politics, and we are in Delaware, we're, we're advancing gender equality and social justice legislation, but we still are fighting for these protections against discriminatory attitudes and behaviors in the workplace and beyond. So um, for, for any of the questions that we are going to speak to, um, a lot of these things are, aren't new. These have been happening. Um, so, I'm not sure if we lost Kathy there. I think so. Uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of jump in since we've got a little tiny gap there. Um, when I think about what's been going on with reproductive rights in the in the most recent past. Uh, essentially, again, sort of talking about the last few months, we've seen this pendulum swing, I think, in that um, there's been a bit more traction um, when it comes to that, that ever-present threat to a woman's right to choose. Um, we've witnessed several states, most severely Alabama, which I might add here as the treasurer, I sit on the Board of Pardons, and Alabama also has some of the most stringent death penalty and child and mentally disabled incarceration practices. Um, and and they've, they've been uh, trying to threaten a woman's right to choose and uh, make it a, a criminal action. And I, I think that it's, it's really surprising, again, to me, to see this type of movement and this type of activity. Um, I, I will say that some of the things that I've seen in the last two years have been, you know, from Representative Valerie Longhurst, from Senator Tizzy Lachman, from Representative Kendra Johnson,
from um, Representative Mimi Brown. Um, and I know that um, Auditor uh, Kathy McGinnis has also been extremely supportive. But, but a lot of the legislation that has been passed is sort of the other side of that pendulum swing where um, Val Valerie just spoke about some of the, the legislation that she passed about um, not, not discussing um, and not being forced to discuss previous um, uh, income. But the other thing that they have fought and pushed for and really done a phenomenal job is 12-week uh, paid parental leave. And what that does is it, it not only um, gives equality to both men and women, because I think that sometimes if we're not inclusive, as we're all sort of talking about some of these things, if we're not inclusive and we're not talking about everyone's uh, equal ability to take time off to be with their child, um, with a brand new child or, or a child that's been recently adopted, um, and, and really making that a priority in, um, as part of our reproductive rights, if you will. You know, everyone uh, tends to these days push back um, possibly starting a family, and it is essential to be able to bond with that new child and um, I think that state of Delaware and, and within our um, House of Representatives and our Senate, you guys have done a phenomenal job. And, and I think that uh, some of these things are, are a direct result of uh, really listening to people and hearing what some of those concerns are and addressing them head on. Um, and I think we need to continue that, that push because as I said, it's, it's shocking to see that we are still talking about um, the a woman's right to choose. It, it feels a little dark ages um, to me. And, and so um, I, I think it's important that we don't neglect that. Well, we did pass the, uh, we did codify the Roe versus Wade um, a, a year ago on Senate Bill 5, um, you know, with all everything that was going on with Donald Trump and, you know, with the Supreme Court. So in our law, it, it was never it needed to be codified to have those protections in Delaware. And believe it or not, we did we did receive a lot of foot pushback, also for paid family leave. Um, mm -hmm. Representative Heppner brought that one forward and that took a, a lot to get that bill in. It, it, we couldn't get it the first year and it took us a year to convince those that be there um, to, to, to pass it and to put the money forward. We also have done a lot on um, IVF, which is we, I worked on legislation on that, and we just need to keep continuing. When you get pushback, you need to continue to push forward and never give up. One of the things I'm proud of, like my caucus members and my women, you know, we don't, we don't ever give up and you can never give up. As those women's back in the suffrage movement, they went to jail for, for us to have the right to vote. And now we have the right to vote and we should continue to vote, encourage most women. I mean, I think it's a higher percentage of women go out and vote today. And I'm sure it's going to be off the charts this year. Um, we did pass the vote by mail this for this upcoming election. So there's a no excuse absentee ballot in this um, presidential election. I think it was like 40% of people voted absentee ballot. Um, and that's a way to keep people, get, getting everybody out to vote. So they don't have to go stand in polls and because of COVID or what have you. So we have to keep pushing forward on some of those issues that we got, we get pushed back. We only, we did it up until this election, but in January, we're going to have to go back and um, extend that law. But uh, there was a little bit pushback for it this year, but we condensed it that it would at least happen during this presidential election year. And then hopefully in January, Representative Brady will bring that bill forward and um, we can make that a permanent part of Delaware's voting right. Thank you. And Morgan, I'm sorry, you had your hand up. That's okay. Um, so I would just like to real quick talk about the difference between reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Thank you. Um, the, the, the reproductive rights are centered around the legal right to access reproductive health care services like abortion and birth control, right? But what good is that right if you don't have access to the services that that right guarantees? That's where reproductive justice comes in. Reproductive justice is a movement coined by black women and, and started in 1994. And it was created because the main organizers of the reproductive rights ro movement were wealthy white women who did not have the lived experience 
or the, um, the, the background necessary to defend the needs of women of color. That is just not something that they could do. And so Black women said, well, we're going to create our own movement and it's going to be a lot more intersectional. And it's going to be about accessibility, intersectionality, and center, centering those most marginalized in the movement for reproductive health. And that distinction is really, really important for us to talk about when we talk about reproductive health issues, because black and brown women are dying at exponential rates from pregnancy and other health issues. These women are the best voices to speak to the changes that need to happen to make reproductive health care equitable and safe for all. And because of that, I would like to ping Shane to uh, speak to us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Shanae? Yes. Um, thank you, Morgan. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's been hard for me to sit on this call. <laughs> a lot of things have been said. Um, but I think Morgan made it very clear, like, reproductive rights and reproductive justice are two different things. And if you want to make sure that Black people and other people of color and all other intersectionalities of people are included in this conversation, and included in this women's movement, the reproductive justice part has to happen. You have to center the most disenfranchised, marginalized group of people you can think of. White women, cis white women cannot be the center of every single conversation when I walk into an organization full of white women. Like, I'm being honest. Like, it makes us very uncomfortable. And then, like, the questions of, like, why we don't know, like, some people are confused, like, why haven't groups, like, white and black groups, like, kind of come together, a white woman, that's why. <laughs> like, that conversation is not happening. If you want us to work together, I need you to say, there's gender disparities, but listen, I know I still get paid more than black women, and we have to do something about that. And I know that I have a high school diploma and I know I have a better chance of getting a leadership role than a black woman with a master's degree. With a master's degree. I don't think I'll get that, that's hurtful. And then when we sit in these conversations and all we talk about is the reproductive rights, we're not talking about the, the injustices that black women or other women of color face to even get, have access to that service. But we talk about abortion services and how we pass that. But do you know the accessibility and the what it takes for a black woman to be able to have an abortion, right? And how the high amendment, that affects black women in low income communities at a disproportionate rate than white women. We don't, y'all don't have those conversations. It's just abortion rights. And then I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, I got the right to have an abortion, but then I have all these other barriers because I'm a person of color. So these conversations have to be had. And I love what Morgan said, and she said it perfectly. And I think, yes, please just, when you, even when you're thinking about legislation and if you sit in a room and you're making legislation about women and it's all white women in there, something's wrong. If you go into any organization and you sit around and it's supposed to be about women and all you see are white women, something isn't wrong. And I need white allies. I need white people to say something because honestly, black people get tired of saying it. <laughs> like, I'm just being, we're tired of saying, I need my white allies. I need y'all to walk into a room with white people and be like, listen, somebody right here, we need to get more people of color in here. And mm -hmm. not even just black women, because I know Indian women, Asian, like different women need to be in the room to hear their stories, right? Because the 19th Amendment did not work for all women. It wasn't just black women. I don't know when other women got rights to vote. So, but I know it wasn't the 19th Amendment. I know that was for white women. And I know um, it's really, it says all women, but let's be honest, it wasn't for all women at that time period. So I think it's just important to note um, but yeah, that's all I have until we move on to the next question, but... Oh, no, Shanae, that, I mean, that was, um, very well put, because I, I, I think in part, um, many of the issues with the women's movement is this idea of essentializing the term woman, as if all women want the same things, all women need the same things, all women look the same. Um, Morgan brought up the term intersectionality, and I think more and more that term itself has become mainstream, but it's been used as a, um, it's been co-opted in many ways without people actually understanding what it means and not practicing the concept itself. Uh, you cannot be 
just one thing, as you pointed out, Shanae, in the comment section. You are a woman. You might be a Black woman. You might be a Black cis woman. You might be a Black cis woman who is suffering or living in poverty. There are multiple identities that uh, bring together your experience, and that experience needs to be acknowledged in all realms when we talk about issues such as reproductive justice, when we talk about issues in accessing the right to vote, when we talk about issues when it comes to police brutality. Uh, so I, I, I completely feel you. Thank I just want to make one quick thing. So yes. it was said that um, Melissa Minor Brown, state rep Melissa Minor Brown passed the legislation to help Black women with their health issues. It is not about Black women's health issues. It is racist health care systems that are killing us. A black woman could be the black woman doctor. I don't, I don't want to make this about maternal health care, but I have to say this. You could be the black woman doctor with the 2.5 kids, the dog, the white picket fence. You could do everything, be healthy, work out every day. You feel me? You do everything the right way, as they call it the right way, right? And you're still, your baby, you carry in your stomach, is still two to three times more likely to die. Serena Williams was married to a white man, had a mixed child, and they still didn't listen to her. And she's an internationally known person making, I don't even know, billions, money I probably would never see, right? So she's making all of this money and it didn't save her. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's not us. It is not what we're doing. It's not a poor health. It is racism and healthcare that, racism and the healthcare systems that are killing us. Yeah, the systemic and the institutionalized racism that exists. So it's not only addressing those issues, but also breaking down the root causes of those issues and not placing the blame on women because oftentimes it's, um, oh, well, you know, she, she wasn't eating the right foods. Uh, she wasn't doing the right thing. She wasn't getting enough exercises, uh, exercise. So it places the onus on women of color versus actually looking at those institutional and systemic racism issues within the healthcare system, especially. Uh, and so because we brought that up, uh, does anyone else want to continue sharing uh, anything along the lines of reproductive justice and or maternal mortality? My hand is off. Yes, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, well, I, 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 I want broaden, to broaden the topic to, 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 to just health disparities and, yes, and, and the impact on, on, on African-American women. And I'm gonna put something on the table that, 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 that for thought. Um, the, the outcry that um, enough is enough and the situation that has brought diverse groups to the table uh, to talk about uh, police brutality against um, African Americans, the health disparities that COVID-19, uh, you know, exposed it goes back to, somebody used the word root, and it goes back to 1619 when African Americans were enslaved. And I just finished writing a paper that looks at racial, uh, that, that looks at, looks at uh, health disparities, and it traces the health disparities that we see today back to enslavement. And the point that I'm trying to make is that Maybe one of the things that we need to think about, if we think about the root cause, you know, of the situation, is that without ignoring of the needs of other marginalized groups, this country has got to make dealing with the circumstances of African Americans a priority. And, and I, I, I think that might be a hard nut for the most liberal persons to think about. Because when you look at health disparities, for example, the data show that when African Americans get the same level of care and resources, the disparity virtually disappears. And so, one of the things that Delaware needs to do 
uh, and its legislators is to come up with an infrastructure where the outcome will be health equity. African Americans will get the same level of care that everybody else gets so that you won't see the disparity in maternal mortality. You won't see a disparity uh, in, 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 in access to, 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 you know, to health care. And then if we have made uh, uh, data that allow the state to, 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 to look at how, how health disparity, what needs to be in place in order for health disparities to go away in, in the African American population, then I think, I think we have gone a long way to addressing a long-standing problem. Thank you, Marlene. Does anyone else like to share? Or are we ready to move on? I can't see everyone's hand, so um, panelists just chime in when you're um, ready to say something. Uh, but uh, a number of you brought up to um, specifically Tara uh, the uh, the LGBTQ community, in particular the LGBTQ youth, um, and their level of safety. Um, I bring this up because there has been a large push for schools to open in the fall, despite the number of COVID-19 cases. And there are uh, arguments on both sides, but some of the arguments include those from marginalized groups who do not have a safe environment to be in. Uh, and I'm, I'm also talking about college age students too, who, who need to, to leave their home in order to have a safe environment. Uh, does anyone on the panel want to share your perspectives or ideas around the educational system as it exists today based on COVID, but also based on uh, the, which I know is a broad topic, the level of education that uh, people receive. And I think um, Pamela might have mentioned this and the lack of historical information that was provided on women of color and marginalized groups contribu uh, contribution to the nation. I know that was a lot, so just take it where you want to go, panelists. I, I'd like to speak to something. I was pinned by a grocery cart by a lady last week in the grocery store, and she said, you have to help me. I can't do this. My kids have to go back. I can't do this. I know women who are now giving up careers because not only were we were successful as moms and professionals and wow, amazing balancing act. Now we're supposed to be educators. I know families where they have one laptop. Does the mom work or which child gets to go, uh, go do their homework? These, I'm looking at it from a, dis I believe, I am confident through DSEA and the smart educators that we can find a way to do, uh, to help our children safely and smartly get the education they need. But 22 million children will not eat if they don't go back to school. We have uh, sexual abuse, we have child abuse. Uh, the disparity between the wealthy and the poor is gonna grow because the wealthier may have options like tutors or private school. And I don't want to say poor, I'll say the everyday person. I went to public school all, all the way through Cape. So I, I'm looking at, the, you're going to see a greater disparity. And what else I'm seeing is uh, when the children were home before school did let out and, and mom is supposed to be working and not be distracted and do everything, uh, why maybe dad got to be in the office with the door shut. Uh, we are really sending women back decades right now. Um, I, I have a grave concern. I know it's probably a different perspective of let's not just open, uh, but I'm also a pharmacist by trade. I also have a biology degree and I also did DNA research in a genetics lab. So I'm coming from a very different scientific approach. And I do believe that we can do this safely and smartly um, with the right precautions, just as we are Delaware is very fortunate. We're very lucky because uh, our state is is moving in, in in a direction. We're progressing forward. So uh, we're very fortunate when you look at some of our neighbors in other states in the country. But I, I really have a concern about the well-being of our children. Some of them 
we find out about abuse or we find they get wellness checks at school uh, or checks as in checkup um, laundry's even being done so so I believe our educators not only are they undervalued and underpaid and have to wear many hats uh, and we need you but to put that all on mom now or single mom or a single mom with kids and some have special needs and that was this one lady who pinned me in the grocery store and said I've got a child with special it's not working it's not working uh, so when when you see that and you see look into their eyes and see how frantic they are I was scared for her I was scared for her and her children so we've got to be coming up with a way and if we can't figure it out let's snag some good ideas from other states that are are doing things in a safe safety first we know that a safe manner to protect our children that's our future we have to we have to find a way to be able to make this work i mean i see sporting events going on i see play dates with kids rolling all over each other i know that uh, camps are open up and down the state and even some summer schools where kids are actually going to school so i know there's a creative way to do it and um, my concern uh, is for these children we are going to lose a generation. Thank you, Kathy. And Pamela, you wanted to chime in? Pamela, are you there? Okay, as we wait for Pamela uh, to come back on, does anyone else want to chime in on this topic? All right, we'll come back to education. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, I, I realized that we've been getting into deep into conversation. It's almost 7.30. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, restorative justice a little bit more, and that's switching gears a lot, I know. Um, and this is really uh, Charitha's background, so I hope you can participate a little bit in this um, conversation. Uh, but as we... Uh, as mass incarceration continues to be um, explored and highlighted, uh, it has been known um, and is very much a fact that black and brown people are most impacted by um, not only police brutality, but mass incarceration. And we've been looking for different ways to address um, some of these issues, and a lot of that revol revolves around restorative justice. So if, Charita, you can share a little bit of your thoughts and your perspectives on that and how we can move forward when thinking about a restorative justice framework. Yes. Well, I think that one of the worst things that happened in, uh, in centuries is that the perspective of the female have been taken away completely in the institutions of society. So the, the feminine perspective is a circle, a circle where everything is inside, interconnected, interrelated, not only other human beings, but also animals and nature. Actually, that's the real thing that exists in the whole world, nature, humans, animals, that's what exists. The rest, it was created, a social creation. So when I was saying that in life we have this untied of this beautiful circle, uh, we became instead of a um, triangle, a triangle of domination, power over people, of uh, the top telling those in the bottom what to do. And one of the things that came out of that is the idea, the mantra that we keep repeating every time that justice is punishment. That's an invention, it's a female. I mean, it's, it's not a female invention. So this idea has bleed into every aspect of our being. You know, when we are at home, we're punished. And it's like we learn to send children to time out, et cetera, et cetera. In the school, we do the same. The teacher tells the children what to do. And, and the rest of society, even in church, even, you know, the power relationships and business, everything is like always a leader at the top and the people at the bottom. Power over people. Mm -hmm. 
what a difference will be when the power relations of a world with more feminine touch is power with others that a circle has, in which every human being is equal, and then we develop them the power within to bring the wisdom. So now imagine this. Most of you are mothers, okay? So you are yell if somebody is yelling this your two children are yelling in the kitchen you're coming and one is bleeding his finger is bleeding and the other huh, run away to the patio what is a mother to do that moment run away with the little one that went to the patio because he's afraid of what happened and stay there with him and say what really happened and now you're going to tell me the story and da -da, and decided yes you did it not you did it that's not what a mother do. That's what the system do. A mother takes care of the bleeding finger. We let the wounds, the ones that we see and those unseen, bleeding alone, neglected. So it's wonderful that we are here to envision and dream, dream and what it could be when that circle of equality and respect will become more than a mainstream society, your culture in America. It will look like this. Number one, those that are hurting will be in the center. Their needs, their human needs will be in the center. Imagine a world with that. All the money will come to create wellness centers, physical therapy, you name it. Instead of offices or correctional facilities or police training in this drastic way and traumatized when they are doing this, it will be such a liberation. Even judges, I've seen judges in Latin America commit suicide because they can't deal with what they are doing. They have to do. So another aspect, the second, not in this order, and I'm just mentioning, because remember, it's this beautiful circle. The other is, how about that when those are ready to take responsibility, are invited and supported to make things right, the way the person that is bleeding tells them to. How will the world look if we do all these things with community, with people that love us, care for us, a teacher of you know, the grammar school, the neighbor, the cousin, my favorite angle, etc. Listening, discussing, planning, strategize from week to week. And then lastly, how this process will look if instead of centering, what did you do? Is it typified by law? We will be saying, what is this spiritual values that we bring here that are gonna be at the base the structural base of our dialogue. Solidarity, respect for each other, unconditional love, etc. How will be we become if that is the case? Um, unfortunately, as I said, this mantra that is a crooked mantra lends itself to the worst scenarios, one in top of the other. And now more women than ever are in incarceration. And, and we continue repeating, repeating this mantra. And I think we all, it is up to all women to start in the house, to let it go, and to bleed it to the beautiful school system and beyond, and the judicial system, and the prison system, and the reentry programs, and life itself. Because we have had enough and it has shows how bad it is to have a male dominated triangle of, of domination over others. And I think it's the time for us to bring the female that our ancestors have always bring about. And when we think about women, of who we are and how we can change the world, that's what we do. We listen to each other with respect. And we're smart. We create greater strategies that actually work. So that's what we need to envision here together. And that is the inspiration that I hope we can continue catching up in every single aspect of our lives. 
Thank you so much. That was beautifully said, and you touched on so many points, um, in particular the male-dominated system and how that male-dominated system perpetuates this notion of violence against women's bodies, against black and brown bodies, uh, as well as your comment about reconciliation. And in order to obtain that, there needs to be acknowledgement of pain and the pain that others have inflicted on the most marginalized. Uh, so thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, and as we continue to uh, go throughout the program, um, part of what Chiritos um, mentioned is the idea of women's labor to this uh, and for political movements as well as women's participation um, in politics. The, the emotional labor um, is there, the emotional labor of um, Black, Indigenous, people of color as well uh, is uh, at the forefront of many of these movements. So as we uh, start getting close to our closing time, if each of our panelists can share in some way uh, the ways in which you see us moving forward um, politically uh, with consideration of the ways in which uh, women, especially women of color, have the tendency to uh, put more emotional labor into addressing uh, equity and equality. I'll start. Um, so simply put, we have a long way to go. There was an opinion piece in the New York Times published earlier this year that stated, if American women earn minimum wage for the unpaid work they do around the house and caring for relatives, they would have made $1.5 trillion last year. And when you think about that statement and the whole discussion that we have had tonight, you really start to think about, okay, well, of that 1.5 trillion, um, how much would white women have made? How much would black women have made? How much would brown women have made? Um, and you start to think of all of this in more than just women as a whole, because as we've said earlier tonight, you can't just think about women's rights issues from one perspective because women are not one perspective. We have different perspectives, we have different needs, um, and we have different lived experiences. And so I think moving forward, uh, we just really need to accelerate progress on women's economic empowerment by passing policies that provide services and basic infrastructure like childcare, um, promoting the sharing of domestic care work between genders and creating more jobs that provide the kind of salary base that men get to. Um, but to underscore all of that, we can't move forward doing any of that without centering the voices of women of color in those progress steps. And I think that that is really the point that we keep hitting home tonight and the point that needs to be made. If I can um, add on a political note, um, I think you don't see change unless you see change in the people that make the policy. Uh, when you sit around the table and you have um, a more diverse uh, table of ideas and, and ways to move forward legislation, I can tell you I've gone around the state and recruited a lot of women for positions in the House and in the Senate. And it's, I always find it fascinating when I call a woman and I say, look, would you like to run for public office? They kind of, you know, take a step back and say, well, they start writing down all their qualifications and what, what will qualify them. And they're like, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. You call a man and you say, hey, would you think about running for office? Yeah, I could do that. So, you know, it's trying to get women to say you are as qualified, if not more qualified as a woman to be in a political office than a man. But we just as women are in this mindset that we have to set all these criteria. We have to set all these up. Uh, we have to have all these things in place before we can do this. And um, we need to get, we need to get over that. And I can tell you, I've recruited lots of women and they have to think about it or men just jump at it. Um, but I'm still going to fight the fight and get more women in legislative hall. We, um, you know, our, our conversation this year around our caucus 
has been more dynamic and we've had a lot more interesting pieces of legislation and legislation that's passing that's making a difference in Delaware and that's due to the diversity of our caucus. So women, if you're thinking about running for political office, just do it. You're qualified. <laughs> more than qualified. That's a great point. Um, I just, I want to follow on to what both um, Representative Longhurst uh, as well as um, Morgan were saying. I, I think that one of the things that we really need to really, you know, put some effort toward is, is, um, is really, you know, as I said from the outset of this conversation, representation matters. I think that, um, you know, it's a, it's a real it's a real and true uh, impact in our in our political mental health is is to actually see what uh, what our our uh, population looks like representing um, representing us and so um, and and then again I would say that some of the things that my office works on is um, is looking at the economics of it it's really economic empowerment. And um, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics back in 2013, they, uh, they talked about a female full-time worker had a median weekly earning of $706 compared to a men's median working of 860. Today, uh, 2019, um, uh, 79 cents for every dollar uh, women are making to their male counterparts. And then uh, now, in the, in the current time, we are making 63 cents. And so those disparities, those gaps are widening. And that is not the direction that we should be headed in. The, the way that this impacts us is actually uh, multifaceted because it's not just our earnings today, it's our earnings in our retirement. Um, if you've got an employer that does a match on your 401k, but your base salary is uh, substantially less, um, it's going to impact you for a lifetime. Um, it also impacts women when it comes to their bonus pay. Women are paid roughly two-thirds of what men are paid. And as Shanae has been saying over and over again, uh, women of color, the, the widest disparity that we see are African-American women compared to their male white counterparts, they make about 60%. So the women at the top, executives is what I'm talking about, um, actually make about 60% of what their male counterparts are. And that's the widest gap we see. And, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, and I think that there's some real uh, change that we, can, uh, that we can do. And I'd love to see us um, with more secure retirement, uh, with more economic empowerment, with, uh, with women able to make decisions for their families as sole breadwinners rather than um, having to, uh, having to, to choose uh, between really vital, vital uh, essentials in their lives. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'd like to add something quickly, if I may, really quick. I want to just go back and say that, you know, when, when you look at where somebody spends their money and you look at their bank statement or checkbook, um, it tells about what they care about and where their priorities are. And in Delaware, we spend more on corrections than we do education. So I just, but, but moving forward, uh, Representative Longhurst is 100% right. Thank God we have uh, Representative Brown uh, Kendra Johnson, uh, Senator Lockman, but we need more. We need more women. We, we need more women, period, but women who will listen and who will act because this is all about inequality. And, you know, who's going to stand up? Do we really want accountability and transparency? I've learned a lot in my first year and a half and watching certain things happen and they're still happening. So we need to get more women in there. We need to get more strong women in there to support everyone. So there's a comfort level to say, you know, this is enough is enough. We're just not going to do it because sadly, we still in a, live in a world um, when in reality with men running it, but in reality where we should be running it. I'll end on I, that. If I can pipe in here. Um, to, to follow up on what you've said, Kathy, and, and the importance of getting back to school and such. 
um, and women and ending up taking the bearing the brunt of, of most of what's going on here. Um, if anything that's coming good that is coming out of this, you know, with, with George Floyd, we're seeing that the police is the whole police system is getting looked at a different way. And we're talking about defunding it and putting some of those resources into better ways of serving the community. I think the same thing has to happen with the schools. We can't count on the schools to identify the abuse and to feed the children and to do all of these things. No, we need to be looking to our community to do that. We're asking them to do too much. We need to look at what's, what's leading to the abuse and the hunger and the poverty so that we're not thinking the solution is, well, we need to get them back to school so that they the, the, the gay kids can find their peers or can find their supportive adult or the hungry kids can get fit fed. No, we need to do that within the community and not do it all within the schools and rely on the schools to do that. Um, what I would like to add and all these uh, wonderful ideas that everybody have done is that women, we need to get together more. We need to you know, bring the best of our children. I, I did a beautiful circle with the uh, um, single moms and the Latino children, and we put it in a, you know, in a, in the center, and we asked them to close their eyes, and the mothers were telling them, you are the light of my life. You are the reason why I live. You are beautiful. You are clean. You smile, etc. And these children with the eyes closed will never, ever forget the voices in that moment in how the other mothers told the children. That's the kind of thing we need to do. We need to put in the center all those transgender people, all this LGBT community people that needs to hear that they are protected in this physical circle and beyond. That's the kind of new thing. So, because together we will start to peer into that mantras that are dominating in our society. One of them is the fact we don't talk in the media, we don't talk among ourselves. We have a war economy, a military budget. 55% of our budget is dedicated to the military industrial complex. So we need to wake up and see, no wonder why we put less in education, no wonder why we put more in incarceration, no wonder there is something wrong. Marion Wilkinson wrote once, what mother in her right mind gets 500 a week and spend 50% of that in making their children secure by buying guns. We do, our, our government do, okay? So that's the kind of conversation we need to have. And yes, I want more women. Yes, I want more, more, more representation, but I also have to say this. Uh, uh, we cannot just go to the identity politics it has to be, as most of you have been saying, we cannot just be there to get the cultural aspect of things, but the real nitty gritty of switching that 55% of our budget into real minimum wage that will make a difference in a mother that are at home now, a medical for all. I mean, this is no brainer. We are whole hostage and we can no longer stand this anymore. I'm so happy with Representative Bali Longo because she pushes, she pushes the real change. And that's what we need. I don't want more women that won't do that. Okay. Right. So it, it, we have to, I mean, for me, this, I don't want to hear the women that are in the national level of Representative Collins. I don't want her. I don't want that kind of woman. I don't want the type of black men or Latino. You know, I don't want the Goya man that has so much and have created an empire of Latinos to go and say to the president, you are wonderful. So I don't care what Turkey is a Latino, you see. Identity politics has, it has to have a filter. You are going to be the real thing. You're going to change the economic craziness that we have in our budget and our way how we deal the male dominated thing of greed. If we are going to address it, then we will be good. I, 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 I'd like to, 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 to continue, you know, I, I guess what I think are the closing comments. I don't know if anyone uh, watched uh, the going home service for uh, Representative Lewis, but, uh, and, uh, and someone uh, pulled my coattails about something profound that Mitch Connell said. 
And when he talked about how Representative Lu Congressman Lewis's career pointed to the country's original sin. And I'm making that point to make this point that COVID-19, uh, George uh, Floyd's murder, we've talked about incarceration, uh, we need to think about that in terms of, of the new Jim Crow, and some of the other uh, inequalities about which we've talked have had grave, long-standing impact on African Americans. And to the extent that this country has not been able to embrace African Americans for whatever reason, I have my own thoughts on that, we are in the position we're in today. And we have a president in office who sees the moment by, by his nativism and um, making African Americans and other people of color a target of the of the of uh, of the country's animus. So I'm saying all this to say that as we come up with strategies that involve working with people who are different than we are, you know, looking at ourselves, we cannot overlook the central issue of race. Uh, and how that is going to need to be addressed uh, in order to get the level of equality uh, that we want uh, for, uh, for everyone. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, would Shmay, uh, Kathy, or Tara like to ch chime in for closing remarks or anything in addition that you'd like to add? or any other panelists for that matter? I'll, I'll end with this. I have a saying on my desk for all the women that are on this call, every single one of you, as you, um, you took part in this wonderful conversation. And I think we've learned a lot and I, I could see from a lot of the comments that people want more from it. But what I could say from everybody on here is that I have a saying on my desk and I live by it. And it's well-behaved women rarely make history. So your voice matters, speak up, speak loud, and stand tall. That's how you make change. Excellent, Valerie. I, I posted a link to an article earlier in the chat that I, I hope um, folks will take a look at, and it connects, um, it connects racism with, with gender issues, with, with the climate, and um, we're, we're not looking enough at what we're doing with animal agriculture and how that is impacting um, poor communities, people of color. Um, they are the ones who are suffering the most because of this. Yes, everybody else is suffering as well. It, it is contributing to climate change, which hurts everybody, but it is hurting the poor people and the people of color the most. So I, I hope you will take a look at that article and see how it is all connected. I do want to say something else. I want to say this. Well, we want to imagine, we have to have power, and this is what I want to say. When Copernic, uh, Colleen Copernic, nailed and was punished, you know what? I would have liked every single woman, every single African American, every Latino, not to even watch the NFL games, not to even, even buy one single um, uh, ticket. That would have changed the mentality. One single act done by the masses of people. That speaks value. So again, I want to go to Goya. Don't buy Goya. Boycott Goya because they are, we are not going to feed the monster. It will, it, if we don't have a strategy, as Marlene said, that is clear as Martin Luther King had with the, with the buses in Montgomery, that affected. It was a sacrifice, but it was a simple thing to do. It was very difficult at the same time, but many did it and that make a difference. And the same thing, no buying things in white uh, uh, owners stores in South Africa. But again, let's not settle for the cultural thing because um, you mentioned it, uh, Emerald, the, the word reconciliation that are always tied by to South Africa experience. And I love Mandela, but guess what? He tied the country with the 
the World Bank and the international we're banking everything, all those organizations, international economic that didn't get anything. There was no change at that level. So let's not settle for the cultural thing. Let's settle for the real thing. Thank you, Trita. And you, uh, you, you, you touched on that economic piece that is very important because in addition to the system being rooted in sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, there is also a level of uh, economic power uh, that comes into play. Uh, and uh, the word is escaping me right now. Uh, and it'll come probably when I get off this phone call. But uh, <laughs> the, the root causes aren't just one thing. And the problem that I have seen us having historically, uh, as many of you are aware, is that we continue to try to address one issue at a time versus looking at the root causes of systemic inequality, inequality collectively. Uh, before I start some closing remarks, are there uh, any other remarks that the panelists would like to make? Yeah, I do want to say thank you for the opportunity. Just remember to center, remember intersectionality. Um, make sure to center the most disenfranchised, the marginalized as women. Uh, we all do want to work together. I want to work with everyone, but then I also want to feel included when I'm working with people. And don't forget Breonna Taylor. We mentioned George Floyd a lot. Breonna Taylor was a Black woman who was asleep and the police killed her. So we have to remember her name. So when we even, that's like for black women, black men names are always being mentioned when police brutality is happening or when anything is happening. It's like we in that movement, we kind of have some things that we're dealing with over there too, right? So just remember to think of black women anytime you can. If you're sitting in a room, whole bunch of white folks, think where's the black people? Where's the Hispanic people? Let's get them in the room. Um, that's really important. So that's all I want to say is that Breonna Taylor, her people who killed her, her murderers are still not in jail. And today would be a good day to lock them up, but it didn't happen yet. And Thank I have you. Thank you, Shanae. I had I have their names listed here. I was prepared to give their names, but you've done that. Thank you. Well, add Vanessa Gilliam. Vanessa Gilliam, the woman that was making to pieces at the military. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, my goodness. Thank you for bringing her up. Absolutely. Vanessa Gillen, yes. I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I've made some new friends that I might have seen your name, but I love your spirit and your energy and drive. And uh, let's see who, let's find people who are going to stand up. Let's find people who are going to listen and they're going to act. Let's find people who want accountability and transparency across all of government. Let's get them in office. <laughs> I, I want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate. And, and I'd like my closing remarks to be, uh, they, they come from James Baldwin. Oh. And he, he once said, the great force of history comes from the fact that we, that we carry it within, within us are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. Jimmy Baldwin. Thank you. I, I do want to finish with Toni Morrison. I've been listening and I cannot stop listening because she has the greatest, deepest understanding of racism. And she says, the moment, the moment, this is not literally, but what I capture, what that you say is the moment that nobody can benefit from racism, it will stop existing. So let's put racism out of business. Let's do a strategies that change the world. Thank you. All right, before I give it over to Rebecca Fay, um, I want to again thank our panelists uh, for this evening's discussion. As someone already mentioned, the chat is uh, very lively and hopefully we're able to get some of us together again to talk about some of these topics. 
uh, this evening's panel was a rare opportunity to bring these amazing women together. Uh, I would like to acknowledge each one of you and thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. Last Thursday, Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez took to the House floor to address vulgar and sexist language used against her by another representative. Regardless of your political affiliation, the speech made by Representative Ocasio-Cortez and the members she yielded the floor to was historic. And in an hours time, remarks on patriarchy, misogyny, racism, homophobia, transphobia, classism were all delivered while disavowing the violent political treatment of women. It was a remarkable moment and reminds us that women continue to extend politically and as they do so, we must stand against power that seeks to maintain the status quo. Oftentimes when that status quo is interrupted, it begins to push and tries to intimidate women from succeeding, especially women of color. Our panelists this evening are indeed interrupting that status quo. They continue to seek justice for the most marginalized, and I am very grateful for having had the opportunity to share this evening with them. Uh, thank you all for your time. Rebecca Fay will have a few words before we leave this evening. Oh, sorry about the yellow screen. Um, so, wow, I just, th that was amazing. And um, I don't think we, we have not even barely scratched the surface of um, all of the topics that we wanted to get to um, and all the topics that need to be talked about. Uh, so while the discussion was going on, there is some background discussion going on about following up with a second panel discussion. Um, so if you're interested, please feel free to email me. My email is rfay at dehistory.org. Um, just the opportunity to have these amazing panelists together um, and discussing these very important topics was just wonderful. I was engrossed the whole time and have to thank again Rebecca Lowe at Lewis Public Library for handling the chat and um, throwing things out there for, for all of you to do. Um, if you um, are, enjoyed the program, um, please uh, fill out an evaluation form that Rebecca Lowe will be sending out in an email as a follow-up to, to this program and comment in there um, again if you're interested in a follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Thank you.